Hey, man. How are you? Good. So How are you doing? Yeah, fine. And you? I'm doing great. You know, I miss going native, dude. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really curious. When's the next C++ conference? Well, the next one is coming now. The next big conference yeah, yeah, yeah. in mid-May. Mid-May. Yes. All right. From the 13th to the 18th. Okay. It's going to be C++ now. C++ now. It's actually a conference formerly known as BoostCon. It's organized by cool. the Boost Library team. Okay. So it's for sure, it's like um, another kind of going native in the sense that there's no necessarily, you know, no uh, single company behind. There are people from many companies. and Microsoft? Yes, of course. We are participating with two sessions this cool. time. So go so. to C++ now. I guess we'll have a URL under there you can click on. Absolutely. Sounds like it's going to be good. We'll find out, uh, you know, you've been, obviously, you must have been involved to some degree. Mm-hmm. And you have some talks. I'll be there. You know, it's in Aspen, in Colorado. So. Oh, rough, man. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, how about a little news? We haven't done news in a while, man. Yes. So what's going on? Well, I have been blogging recently. Actually, I published an article in MSDN Magazine in May. Mm. We were talking about concurrency. It's like a one-on-one -on, -one on the standard concurrency features we have implemented in, in Visual C++ 11. So, okay. You know? So by reading that article, you will have like a rough idea about what the standard is introducing and what it, each technology means mm. if you try to make your applications more time efficient. Excellent. So there are, of course, there are further sources of information you can find in the blog post that I believe that we are putting the link yeah, of course. below, you know, and yeah. you can later check. Nice. Good job, man. You've been really busy. Great. That's good yes. stuff. There now, are more, more content we are working on. Sure. Now, so. speaking of parallelism, uh, you know, which, of course, isn't the same thing as concurrency and mm -hmm. vice versa, but whatever. Speaking yes. about doing same things at the same time. Sure. And really making code run efficiently on modern hardware. Absolutely. Um, your team, now, of course, a part of your team we haven't spent very much time with at all. Yeah. The compiler guys the compiler and guys. girls yes. um, have done some amazing work. Mm -hmm. uh, that I really think needs a little bit more visibility, So as, w as do you, so we're making it more visible. Absolutely. And that's sort of auto-vectorizing your code, yes, yes, your loops. Yes, yes. So the VC11 compiler can automatically determine which loop can be vectorized. And that's very cool, of course, if you're running on modern hardware and you have something that's SIMD capable. Sure. And you know, I can't imagine people running processors today that aren't. Yes. Uh, so... So to make it uh, clear, this is not a, a library we are adding. No, this is a just, compiler. Yes, you write your code as usual, and then the uh, assembler code or the machine code yes. that is being generated is taking advantage of these sim uh, instructions that in modern hardware. You is, got it. And so, yes. for example, if you have a loop where you're trying to add uh, two arrays of floating points or whatever, mm -hmm. um, this code will go through. And the machine code that it'll generate will actually instruct the SIMD-capable sure. processor to do four. So you go through one iteration, it'll do four yes. computations yes, um, simultaneously. Great. So you're talking about 2x or 8x speed pretty yes. immediately. And you, you, there's even some cases where it's even more profound than that. Great. So you know, rather than us kind of talk about it, but you know what? We're capable of talking about it. Absolutely. But we're going to go talk to the people who actually built this. Which of my, who of my colleagues Well, are you? you know, this is actually an interesting story. Jim Hogg. Okay. He's okay. one of the first guys I interviewed when I was doing Channel 9. Really? Which, that. my God, that's all I do. So that's back when I was, had, you know, my hair was darker, I was thinner, you know, I was younger, I had more energy. God knows what else was going on with me, man. But he was, I remember interviewing him about the Phoenix compiler. Okay. Early okay. on in that little project. And it's nice that Jim has come back to you guys. Great. And he's the PM for this project. My hope is that one of the developers will stop by. It depends on how many bugs he has to fix. Sure. But that would also be nice. Great. It's but there's also fun. the auto vec uh, parallelizer. Okay. But I think we're mainly going to focus on the vectorizer. Great. So vectorize. All right. We are in C++ world. We're going to talk about vectorizer and compiler things. We are with Jim Hogg. 
Hi. How are you doing? So, Jim, what do you do these days on the C++ team? So, recently rejoined the C++ team, uh, looking after the back end and some of the, the cool stuff that we do there for optimizations. Excellent. You've been on Channel 9 before? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, last time I was on Channel 9, I was with this same team, but we were doing a different project, uh -huh. which we Phoenix. called Phoenix. Yes. yes. And I believe we also interviewed you with another Jim. That's right, a very long time ago uh, when I was working on the CLR team, uh, I did a joint interview for, I think it was Channel 9 at the time, with Jim Miller. Excellent. And today we have another Jim in the room. This is Jim Radigan. Hi. How are you doing? You are a developer, a compiler developer. Tell us about what you do on, on this team. I am the dev lead, for the op dev lead and the architect for the uh, C++ optimizer. Excellent. And speaking of optimizing code, we're going to talk about the vectorizer today, okay. auto vectorizer, uh, and then we'll also dig into some of the other optimization improvements you've made in the compiler. So let's start with the auto vectorizer. What is it? Why'd you do it? How does it work? Oh, um, the all of the chips that are coming out of Intel and and ARM have uh, wide, wide, wider vectors and instructions that will operate on them. So what you can do is basically with one instruction you can um, do four operations. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty straightforward. The, the, uh, a simple uh, vector instruction would be add, pack, singles, XMM, zero, XMM, one, and this is sort of what it looks like. These would be the two registers. These are like 128 bits. So literally, you can get four operands in there at a time. And so that's the add, and then that result goes back into another register. And in this case, it's XMM zero. <coughs> so what's great is you could take a simple loop uh, for i equals zero, i less than 1,000, i plus plus, and a sub i equals b sub i plus c sub i, like that. And what you can do is basically because of this underlying architecture, you can do four four of these ads with every one of these instructions. And so basically that loop is going to trip uh, only a quarter of the, the time it would have it previously. So a good way of talking about this then at the chip level, I think, which is really important, is if you were to look at um, you know, the CPU, this is the CPU, you basically have this is the scalar unit. And these are, and this is probably, well, this is, this is a bad, bad drawing, but this is the cache. And this is some other glue. So in Dev, in Dev 10, what we were doing is we were generating instructions only for the scalar unit. And now, by taking advantage of Intel's um, SSC2 instruction set, we've essentially allowed C, unaltered C++ to take advantage of the, the vector units, which perform these types of operations. And then on top of it, what's really cool is everything is multi-core as well. So you could extend this picture and duplicate it further, right? Which is that's one core. Right? So if you were to have four cores, you've got the vector unit here, and then also another duplication here of the vector unit. And the scalar as well. This is the scalar. 
Scalar. Scalar. So now, by uh, <coughs> making the changes that we've done to code generation for an unaltered C++, we're really taking full advantage of the chip. Nice. And so the, the, the real estate that was available was not being fully utilized by default ordinary C++ compilation. And so this is a, a huge um, draw for us to advance the compiler technology in order to move the entire platform. So one of the things we have to do is we have to build uh, three flavors of Windows, two different versions of SQL, all of Office, all of DevDiv, all the tools. And so if we get a speed up like this in one particular loop and it hits in a part of Windows, we speed things up. So for example, we were able to uh, make a big change just recently to um, Windows so that we could vectorize the multimedia player properly. Nice. And that gave the multimedia player a net 10% speed up on the, on the phone. Great. So, and that was with unaltered C++. So no, no, you keep saying unaltered C++, so this is automatic. Yeah, it's I on. I do nothing. Thank you, great. And you do it well. Well, no, well, <laughs> exactly. So in some sense, the question I would ask though right off the bat is, the compiler is doing more work. So what's the cost in terms of compile time? Oh, um, one of the things, so, one of the things, the constraints we have is we absolutely put like correctness first, then compile time uh, second. So within those, within that budget, we could not advance compile time at all. So when we go to build Windows, it's right now uh, on one of the dev boxes. It's gonna, it takes about 24 hours to complete. Mm -hmm. So before we do every check-in, you've got to build Windows, and Windows has to build Windows. So there's a huge amount of money tied up in just compile time. And so this project was constrained by that. So one of the things we did also in uh, Dev 11 with the compiler that's just about to go out with uh, Windows 8 is we multi-threaded the back end. Mm. So that uh, was a ginormous speed up for many, many things. But even single thread, we had to do the constraints before the check-in to prove that we didn't slow the compile time down. So there was an, an enormous amount of um, engineering because a lot of the, the parts of the compiler are probably over 20 years old. And we compile everything in the company. So uh, to do major surgery, mm -hmm. have it on by default, and then get it in, it's gonna, it takes time. Understood. So there was a large engineering effort just on the changing the infrastructure and the internals of the C++ compiler. So, so let me go back just for a second or, yes. or so and just scribble some extra things into to Jim's <laughs> diagram. So, <laughs> so when we're talking about vector units there, these are the registers called XMM0 through XMM15, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, the scalar units, these are the, the, the registers that we all know and love called RAX, RBX through, you know, R15. So that, that just puts things into context for folks that are not familiar with that diagram. Uh, and, and as Jim explained there, uh, in the old days, like for VS 2010, mm. the previous release, if you wrote C++ code, then we made use of scalar units. So in effect, we went around a loop like that 10,000 times, and each time we, we added two numbers together, two numbers together. And the difference when we auto-vectorize is you don't change anything in the source code, but we analyze it very, very deeply and change it so that it's doing not one operation at a time, but four operations at a time. Mm -hmm. So it, it goes four times as fast on tight loops. Uh, so that was just to, to kind of explain a bit more about what, what was actually on Jim's diagram there. That's a good sure. addition. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, again, just to, to thump home the, the point is this works on unchanged code. So all you need to do is take the code that you've got today that you've been uh, building with VS 2010, mm -hmm. uh, pick up the beta drop that, that went out a few weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, with the, the beta for the VS 11 compiler. Just build your code, uh, measure it. It should run faster. Okay. If the vectorizer hits. If the vectorizer hits. <laughs> <laughs> now that that's actually brings up an interesting question. That's a very trivial example for code that people actually write in yes. the real world. Yeah. So 
um, in some sense, as a developer, how can I be confident that I'm going to get this sort of auto vectorization on any given loop that I write? I mean, obviously, so you mentioned tight loops four times. Talk to me about what actually do you, so if you look at a chart of what, you know, I'm absolutely going to vectorize, yes, yeah. no, maybe. Yeah. Take us through that. So, so, so it kind of breaks down into several levels. So the first one is the example that Jim had there. Mm -hmm. I'll keep it with I. A of I is B of I plus C of I. That's what we'd call embarrassingly parallel. Uh, the vectorizer will pick that up easily. Okay. Uh, but you can do other things. So let's look at A of I equals uh, two times A of I plus one. Uh, we'll pick that up and auto vectorize it. If I change that to two times A of I minus one, uh, then for reasons that maybe Jim will explain, uh, we will not auto vectorize that. Hmm. in the current version. Again, this is the first release of Auto Vectorizer. Intention is that we'll recognize more and more patterns as we go forward and make it ever better. Great. So, Jim, why? Well, there's a theory. I don't know if it's a, if we're going to scratch the surface, there's a theory of data dependence that actually goes on. And you have to... One of the things that happens in order to... I'm going to erase this. Is, okay. And I won't go into the whole thing because this is... Uh, a little bit deep, but the uh, what we have to do in order to vec automatically vectorize that thing is we've got to be able to look across iterations of the loop, and by that I mean we've got to be able to look at the loop as um, what's going to happen in i equals one, i equals two, i equals three. So if you had some the loop that Jim is talking about, you're going to have a sub i equals a sub i minus 1, right? Then if you, let me start this way. If you start the iteration space for this, what this looks like is this is a sub 1 equals equals a sub 0. And then i equals 2, this is a sub 2 equals a sub 1. And if you if you notice in the second uh, iteration of the loop, there's a flow dependence from here to here. So that write is going to be consumed by this read on the second iteration. So the write occurred in the first, the read occurred in the second. And so you can't use that, you're not guaranteed that you understand the semantics uh, the, whether you, you can't understand whether the vector semantics, which is to load everything at once, operate on it all at once, and write it all back at once, is going to be correct when you have this dependence. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done in the compiler is a tremendous, a tremendous amount of what we call loop-carried dependence analysis to figure out if it's legal to map these constructs in the loop onto vector semantics. And that's, that should be a presentation in and of itself. Great. That sounds interesting. Well, thanks. I just wanted to... Yeah. Most Make of the sense. work that we did for the, the, the compiler, though, that was... One of, one, there, we have a... Part, one, of the, one of the slides I have is that it, it ain't your grandfather's vectorizer. And so the reason is um, one of the things, you know, if you take that same loop and you convert it into the... the that's a, a great way of looking at the vectorizer from the point of view of, uh, of a Fortran world, right? But what we've tried to do is move this into C++. So if I have int star A, int star B, int star C, like this, passed in, and then I've got my for loop here, and I've got star A plus plus equals star B plus plus, say multiply by star C plus plus, right? That's maybe a more pointer-oriented way of writing modular code where the base of these arrays is passed in because we're writing C plus plus. So we don't really know where they're aligned, and we also don't know specifically where they uh, where they reside in memory relative to each other, and we don't know that 
these induction variables, A, B, and C, really can be mapped back to sort of like a pseudo construct of A sub I, right? And this can be mapped back to B sub I, and this can be mapped back to C sub I. So we invested tremendously on being able to do a lot of work that got ordinary C++ back into a form that looked like arrays so we could do that loop carry dependence analysis mm. and make it useful. And so, uh, you know, this is just one small perturbation, but you can imagine these guys striding through an array and taking out fields on each iteration. So that simple diagram where I showed you before um, of the loop carry dependence analysis has to look at iteration i, what the, the memory looked like, iteration two, what the memory looked like, iteration three, really requires that we can get that subscript into a canonical form to do the math that allows us to see if it's legal. Mm. And that's, that's, that's really where you could connect the dots between um, what we've done for the analysis and how that maps onto vector code generation. I think that might be something you'd want to talk about later. But that's just a preview. So most of the money we most of the money went into maybe getting C into a form that could be analyzed for a whole bunch of things. And then also one of the things really that um, we have to do is um, take A, B, and C, and since we don't know anything about these, they're passed in. We also, when we vectorize this loop, have to emit a whole bunch of runtime checks to disambiguate and determine whether A, B, and C partially overlap. Hmm. And so what we do, too, is, um, so it's great because it's a superscalar. We can actually do runtime checks before the code we auto-vectorize, and we can also do um, instruction set availability. So we also introduced, in the first version of the vectorizer, the ability to use different instruction set architectures. So by default, SSE2 is on, we say, but we also can, in, when, we, 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 when we think it's profitable, we can also precede the loop with an ISA check and then vectorize this for uh, instructions that are only available in the 4.1 instruction sets. Mm -hmm. And some of those are really important. So like 4.1 has uh, some really good min and max that allows us to crush control flow and vectorize loops that just have ordinary if-then-else constructs in them. And so the, the, the thing, the biggest takeaway from this short overview, I would hope, is that um, people s see that um, vectorization really is the, as the way it's been implemented by, um, it, by us, in C++ targeting the instruction sets that Intel provides, it really is general purpose computing now. Hmm. So it's there for integer codes, it's there for conditionals, idioms. We've also learned to uh, get the vectorizer to recognize loops where this entire statement could be turned into a call into hand-optimized code in a library. Hmm. All right. I think there's a, a, a one of the big points going on here that we've not spelled out is that the auto vectorizer is safe, right? Guaranteed mm. safe. In other words, it does enough analysis to be sure that any transformation still produces the same answer as you would have got without vectorization. And you can contrast this with other programming models which the user inserts pragmas, the roundabout loops that say, go parallelize this because I am telling you it is safe. Uh, these frameworks don't always check that it's safe to do it. They, they just take your word. And if you get it wrong, if you don't understand things like loop carry dependencies, you get wrong answers. Mm. Uh, the vectorizer, uh, in complete contrast, does the analysis on your behalf to make sure that what transformations we're doing are safe. You still get the, the correct answer. Excellent. So now one question I would have is what are some of the, the canonical cases that you seeing in real code where where it doesn't necessarily work out as you expected. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything like that? I mean, have you seen examples well, of... So, so let me give you an, another example uh, here where as I was uh, ramping up, 
it struck me they'll never get this. <laughs> How are we possibly going to vector that? There's a lot of those. <laughs> right. There's a lot of that. And it's the case <laughs> where we've, we've got a loop as before, and we're doing something like sum plus equals a of i. Okay? So this is a reduction case where we're running through a loop just adding all the elements together. Mm -hmm. So if you try and vectorize this, uh, you would think it can't possibly work because I can't do four operations at a time. I can't, I can't suddenly say that sum plus equals, and I'll use a notation here that says i colon i plus 3. So that's a notation. That's not legal C++. It's a notation that, that means all the elements from A of I through A of I plus 3, so four in a row. Uh, and it's a notation stolen, I think, from Fortran and a few other languages. It's not legal C++. But I can't vectorize my loop and, and have that calculation because, I mean, what, what will that hold, you know? Mm. Uh, so I thought, yeah, the vectorizer is never going to do this. But in fact, it does because it cunningly says, well, you know what? I'll construct a little array of, of sums. And I'll do sum of i as that. Sum of i plus 1 is equal to a of i plus 1 through i plus 4. If, if you see where I'm going. And at the end, it's going to end up with four sums sum 0 through sum 4, through sum 3. And at the end, it just does a, a single addition that gives you the answer. So if you look at what's happened, instead of adding a of 0 plus a of 1 plus a of 2, we've broken it down into four sum sums and said we'll have a of 0 plus a of, let me get this right, 4 plus a of 8 plus added to a of 1 plus a of 5 plus so we've transformed the calculation from the original into this cunning form that gives you the answer approximately four times faster, uh, but still gives you the correct answer. Nice. So that's one example where I thought, yeah, they'll never get this one, but they do. <laughs> uh, shall I mention in passing, I'll mention in passing, there's, there's two floating point models called FP Precise and FP fast. We could probably do a whole session on that, but for those uh, looking at that reorganization and worrying, this one's only legal under that floating point model. Uh, but nonetheless, the auto vectorizer, if you enable that, uh, will do that fancy transformation for, for you. Excellent. Very nice. So, um, the other question I would ask is, so this is for Cindy enabled hardware, you mentioned that at the beginning. Isn't there also, a, what is it, VTX or ATX or? AVX, AVX. you thinking? Have you, can we talk about that? So, so I guess you could look at the, tr the trend within the industry uh, for, for vector machines. Uh, as we started at, I guess you could say we started at 64 bit uh, with uh, MMX registers. Uh, next generation was 128 bits, which is what we're talking here with SSE instruction set. Uh, already it's yeah. gone up to uh, 256 bits. Okay. Uh, and announced from Intel, the next generation chips, like Knight's Corner, they will have instruction vectors that are 512 bits long. Wow. So you can see the trend. Each time it's doubling the potential speed up on wow. tight loops. Excellent. Uh, and again, this, this all comes for free. You just go down to your hardware store, buy the latest generation of PC, mm -hmm. uh, and it will have wider and wider vectors. And, and uh, One of the things that's cool, though, I think, too, along the lines is, as, they, as Jim was saying, is, as they get the vectors to be wider and wider, they're also changing the instructions. So we're able to, so for example, AVX2 has a rich instruction set for a richer instruction set for allowing us to do bit masking. In other words, vectorize code that has uh, forward control flow in it, mm -hmm. which allows us to then incorporate more C++. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no it's uh, great. I'm thinking, so, so other areas, uh, again, that kind of surprised me as I was ramping up, uh, I wondered. Uh, how, how will we vectorize? How will we auto vectorize a loop that goes the usual four, right? 
but up here does, uh, let's say, a of i, and I'm now using floats as opposed to ints, uh, equals sine of a of i. How can we possibly vectorize that? Because sine is single core, right? It works on a single core and, and does probably rational uh, approximation to get the answer for sine or tan or cos or whatever. So how can we do that? And the answer there is, uh, Jim has a, a, a vector library underneath that whenever we see that code and that we've just gone through auto vectorization, uh, we hand off the code to the vector library and it does four of these in parallel. Uh, and in fact that's so heavily optimized. Uh, in fact we have actually seen speed ups of more than four times, more than 4x, due to the efficiency of, of that vector library. Excellent. Okay, so maybe we should we should switch gears now slightly and say that as well as auto vectorization, uh, the VS11 compiler includes another feature called auto parallelization, mm -hmm. and the two work hand in hand. Uh, so, auto vectorization—that's uh, what we've been describing, making better use of the the, the registers that are there. I, I suppose you could summarize it by. In VS11, we use all the registers for you, right? <laughs> and a, an analogy might have been that, you know, in, in VS2010, it's kind of like going to the, the, the garage, buying a new truck with a, a V8 engine, bringing it back home, and find that it's only firing on one cylinder, right? Mm. What are the other seven doing? Well, in a sense, with, with vector, auto-vectorization, a similar such situation in that VS2010, if you write straightforward C++ code with no explicit threading or whatever, we're using the scalar registers, but we're not using the vector registers on your behalf. With VS11, we are. Mm -hmm. So that covers the, the case for a single core, but again, if I go down to the local hardware store and, and lay down my $500, I, I get a PC today that's got four cores in it. So how do we extend these uh, auto vectorization to run across all four cores as well? Uh, and there we've got a feature in VS11 called auto parallelization. Long word and difficult to, to say correctly. Mm. Uh, that will attempt to, if you enable it, mm -hmm. will attempt to look at your loops and make them run on parallel cores. And again, it, it uses much the same deep analysis as we do for auto vectorization. It's safe, so it's very conservative, uh, and only in a few cases will it find enough work that is sure will benefit from auto parallelization. But if you have more information in your head about the size of a loop, for example, you know that although the, the function takes an, a parameter n for the loop size, mm. you know in your head that n is going to be enormous, like it's going to be a million or more. Mm. You can insert a pragma which hints to us that we should. Uh, consider parallelizing that loop. So these two work together uh, and on a good day when the code matches the patterns that are recognized by the vectorizer and the parallelizer, uh, we will be burning all of the, the watts possible on the, the PC to use both the vector registers and multiple cores. <laughs> so you give me a device with more registers on it, I compile yeah. it with a compiler that's like what you guys have, does auto vector, auto parallelize, and my stuff's going to run faster mm -hmm. without me making any changes. If, if, your, if your code patterns are legal and we can safely analyze that they are legal, sure. right, so that is a big practical constraint. And so uh, we're coming out with a V1 vectorizer and we're only um, making sure that we're hitting the obvious patterns and we're making sure that we can build and boot Windows on x86, x64, and ARM and then survive the stress labs before we then check in. Mm -hmm. So uh, remember, correctness first, compile time, and then finally, can you speed it up? Mm -hmm. So given the wall clock time and the constraints under which we have to prove correctness, this is V1, we're trying to hit as many things as we possibly can. V2, which we're hoping to get out possibly, uh, possibly uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer. <laughs> that uh, we're gonna 
refine and improve the, um, the number of C++ patterns that we can hit by default so it really begins to uh, fully maximize the technology. So it's SIMD registers and it's SIMD computation because it's not only the registers, it's also, it's not, it's not only the registers, it's also the opcodes, right? So you got to get the things in and you got to work on making sure you emit the optimal vector SIMD instructions. And the other thing that's a big hindrance to getting the full performance is making sure that the data is properly aligned. And one of the problems with C++ is it totally obfuscates the alignment of what you're operating on. So if you have any kind of an aggregate, like an array, mm. or you name it in C++, right? If you've got some opaque pointer pointing to that aggregate, you don't know whether it's 0 mod 4 aligned, 0 mod 8. And that's a big issue because when we go to these new registers here that are 256 bits wide, the memory hierarchy of the machine really takes a beating when that, those, those, are, those loads to get those registers ready for the final instruction have to be 0 mod 32 aligned. Mm -hmm. And so we, in the next version, are going to have to really focus on making sure that the alignment of all these, these uh, data structures for C++ is optimal. So a lot of stuff has to come together to really, really take advantage of the hardware. And Absolutely. What else have you guys done in the compiler, man? I mean, that, that you give us for free. Anything? Well, I would have to say that for Dev 11, there's, there's quite a bit, and it might be worth talking about later. Uh, the, the, we multi-threaded the back end. We... Uh, now, for just one second, though. What does that actually mean? Because... One of the things, I remember having a conversation about just sort of jokingly saying, why don't you guys you take the C++ compiler and target the GPU and spread that a 380 core workload, right? Or do some crazy stuff like that. People were like, you know, whatever. They give me the look of that you just gave me. So <laughs> the question I would ask is... No, I was looking at my coffee. So talk to me about, <laughs> talk to me about like, what, is, what do you mean by multi-threading? What exactly is going on? Well, it's easy. The, you know, conceptually, we can draw a, a quick diagram. If, 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 you have a, if you have main calls bar, calls foo, right? Mm -hmm. And then over here, bar is a function, and it calls, let's say, a1. And then over here is foo, and it calls... Uh, a2, like this. Normally, if this were one self-contained C++ file, we would compile as it appeared in source order, right? You would compile main, then you would compile this, then you would compile this, right? But what we do by is we build a call tree now, and we use the call tree to drive what can be compiled in parallel. So if you've got main, and you see main calls bar and bar calls foo and foo calls a2. Sorry, this is a bad diagram. I'm running out of asphalt. So let's do this. Main and it'll call foo and it'll call, let's say bar this calls a1 and this calls a2 if you if you look when we build this call tree right away we could since most of the architectures are, are multi-core I can compile both these guys right away at the yeah. same time then I then once they're compiled I can compile these guys at the same time and then compile main and so what we're finding actually pragmatically which is kind of cool when we build windows is it's the the dependencies in the call graph that actually restrict the maximum amount of parallelism that we can get in speeding things up. There are some sweet spots where your code is incredibly broad, right? Mm. And if it's really broad, then you can actually take advantage of many, many cores, and that's when distributed compilation actually makes sense. And But the common case is that uh, for C++ programs, 
those patterns look different actually than what it is for OS patterns, but uh, we're seeing you know eight cores at once as being kind of a sweet spot. Mm. And that actually is funny because it, it coincides directly with what the default hardware is coming out of uh, Intel you know going forward for this year. Go coming back to the original assertion about um, all the other things that we've done, mm -hmm. we've multi-threaded the, the back end. We've um, vectorized, auto-parallelized. We've brought up the ARM compiler so that we can build and boot w and stress Windows for Windows 8 on ARM. Um, we've also introduced uh, some new technology for doing security, which I'll talk about in another presentation. Okay. And also one of the things, too, is we brought up a type system, an abstract C++ type system, so we can do devirtualization. So in other words, if I'm at a call site, it's an indirect call, and I know that there will be only one type for that pointer, mm -hmm. we'll substitute what the direct call would be rather than using the V table. Nice. And we're actually using that technology going forward for a whole host of things. Mm. And of course, you've run the vectorizer over your source code. Yeah. And so how did that go? Compiler's faster now, huh? And, it's, and it works. It's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so Excellent. one of the things that's pretty... So parts of the compiler are really old, and a lot of it is done with uh, bit vectors for propagating information through the program, attributes like availability or reaching. And uh, those bit vectors, uh, note the word vector, right, map directly onto uh, vectorization. So one of the benchmarks we do for uh, seeing how healthy we are for uh, speedups is uh, GCC, Spec2K6 GCC, which is a compiler. Mm -hmm. And I accidentally turned off some stuff to get the code size down, and I turned off in the, some stuff in the vectorizer. And what happened was uh, I couldn't get the check-in in because the tools that we have for automation found that I had slowed GCC down by 3.5%. And it was because I, I didn't vectorize loops that had character size operands in them. Interesting. So that was, that was you know, a day in the life to verify. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, the day in the life, you're writing C all day long. Uh, no, we, life? we actually have uh, been able to, we, we've been able to use templates. We've been able to do a whole bunch of things. So do you use, do you use advanced sort of meta template programming at the compiler level? Uh, we try to steer away from really complex things like that sure. because what happens is it, the, the, the tire hits the road when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody sends you a prize zero <laughs> bug and Windows doesn't boot, right? So sure. you're in the build app. And so what, what, we, you know, what we engineer for clearly is maintainability. You want somebody to come up to speed, be able to go in, binary search Windows, and then step through the debugger and the compiler and find out where we did the illegal sequence. Mm -hmm. And um, so if somebody... And one of the other things that happens when we go to check code into the compiler is we do code, pure code review. Mm -hmm. So if you survive that, right, that's probably okay. It's not too complex. But if you try to check in meta, meta level meta programming constructs with four or five different include files and you've got a, mm -hmm. virtual methods that wind up taking you places you can't see unless you're in the debugger, no one will let you check that in. Sure. Understood. It's just that uh, the template metaprogramming is sort of an interesting thing and very powerful. You guys use it a lot. The library level. Yes. It's very important for library types. It's like the compiler developers, which we don't get to talk to very often. Right. And it's interesting to see what patterns you We do use STL, but we don't, use, we, don't go, we don't go really abstract because we want to be able to quickly debug. Absolutely. But I think, again, it raises a point that you brought up a few minutes ago that we've done all this low-level stuff in the, the back end of the compiler for optimization, not a vectorization, which most people don't even know is going on. Yeah. Uh, but because it's done at such a low level, everybody that uses the C++ language benefits, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so including our compiler, but including more especially things like the STL, the, the libraries, the CRT, Windows itself, everybody that builds with C++ benefits from, from this technology that is embedded so deeply. Absolutely. Uh, and this, the same holds true for when it goes out and uh, customers start building their own libraries and frameworks, etc., etc. And at the end of the day, those of us, you know, the people who actually use these products will see, will experience faster 
performance. We're <laughs> hoping. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just compile time. I mean, that's really interesting. The numbers that you've shared are very impressive. I mean, just the 4x alone. But one of the, I mean, some of the, some of the places that we went right away were, were the the traditional CPU benchmarks because we were trying to bring this thing up with a thesis that is general purpose computing. So we went to the general, you know, Spec 2K6 benchmarks, mm -hmm. and um, the cherry in that one was um, Hummer, I think, was the benchmark, and that's a DNA sequencing uh, mm -hmm. algorithm, and it's all written in integer codes, and it's really really branchy, and so. We were able to vectorize that and get enormous speed ups on, especially on x86. I think we, relative to the Dev 10 compiler, and, and no guarantees this will happen for everything, we got a 48% speed up. Nice. That was really huge, and it required us to uh, put a dispatch before the loop to, to di differentiate run to, at runtime whether it was a 4.1 instruction set available on your CPU. And then, you know, if you hit the floating point things, like an, a, a good old-fashioned um, end-body simulation, we get enormous speed-ups there. Uh, we were able to speed up libquantum. We were able to speed up uh, even Zalink, which is an XML parser, which is a, a C++ parser. Uh, it's, a, it's an XML parser written heavily in C++ with virtual methods all over the place, and we were able to actually get a 3% speed-up on that. These things, the 3% matters because when we hit like that in certain uh, unexpected ways, like branchy C++, it maps onto Windows, or it's going to map onto Office, or it's going to map—it's going to map onto something in the platform. So we're not necessarily targeting all of this technology towards the traditional. Um, I want to do. Uh, Simulations. I don't want to do uh, weather forecasting. I don't want to you know, do uh, oil exploration. We really want to raise the whole platform, all the integer-based codes, and that's a, that's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So quantifying that alone is going to take a team of people, and that's one of the things we're working on now. We built it first; it's correct, but we're really scrambling now to accurately measure the performance and find the language to accurately communicate that, right? So if I say, oh, look, I got 100x speed up on this floating point loop, that's incredibly misleading, whereas, you know, the general picture would require a long explanation with data points, and that's where we're headed to uh, ship right now. Excellent. Well, hey, great job. And the final question I would have mm -hmm. uh, is, what are some of the big problems you're thinking about? What are you working on? Not for V2, you know, I don't want to get into the what's coming up, you can't talk about it, but what are some of the, you didn't solve all the problems here, but this is a great start. It's an incredible start. What's well, going on? The biggest thing that we learned from this is tools. You're only as good as your tools. So being able to develop this technology in an environment like this has really, in the last two years, taught us some lessons at what I would describe as developing an RTM quality. So. That may not be what you wanted to hear from the customer point of view. I don't know, but the the the, the ability to get our automation and our our stress testing to a level that allowed us to actually advance the technology was key. And so, making that even better and advancing it is probably the highest priority for me right now going forward in the next, I would say, three weeks. <laughs> Just if, if you want it. You're only as good as your tools, and um, you know if you have a team of people. You know now that you've got critical mass, the technology is available. You want to scale this to say eight developers, and you want to have that much change and that that rapid a pace of innovation. You still have to prove that you can build and boot three flavors of Windows and stress test it. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the number one thing. The, the second thing is the ability to go in and um, actually extract things that were missing just by a little bit. So if you can, if you can tell me that if I just change my code, you know, change a loop body to have one extra statement or just skew the iteration pattern a little bit and you get a 4x speed up, I think that kind of uh, Discovery and tools internally are going to be probably where we spend a tremendous amount of time. Yeah, I, th I think as, as Jim says, going forward, it's going to be a matter of analyze more and more patterns in real world code uh, and tune the, the heuristics and the algorithms and the auto vectorizer to catch more cases. Mm. Uh, but in particular, the one where 
you, you, you rebuild your, your application and it runs faster, which is good, mm -hmm. uh, but could it have run just faster yet by m making a few tweaks to your code? Uh, and at the moment, uh, we don't have any tooling or even logs that help you in that respect. So that's one of the big areas I think that would help moving forward that says, you know, and I'm flying a kite here, you know, we've not got a design yet, but the idea would be that within the IDE, you can look at your code and uh, uh, as you're developing it, uh, do a test run optimized. It will come back and say, well, you know, we managed to vectorize that, 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 and something else, uh, but this one we missed. And even better, maybe give you a hint or a link to some cookbook that says, you know, here are the patterns that are friendly to the auto vectorizer. Mm. So that, that again is another area uh, built on top of this, you know, deep technology that would help the overall story. Now for the Ultra um, Ninja, uh, you know, C++ developers are elite developers, but yes. I mean for the Ultra, yeah. um, what if you were able to instruct the compiler to like stay away from wasting time compiling this, you're not going to be able to vectorize it. I know it already. Don't you waste your time on it. Yeah. So, so we have a, you, you can actually throw a, a pragma into the, the, the code that says do not vectorize this. Great. However, uh -huh. <laughs> I would caution against Don't using it. Don't do that, it. yes. <laughs> because, uh, now Jim never had a, a chance to show a beautiful example it has in one of the slide decks where it mm -hmm. takes a large loop, which is really complex, mm -hmm. and in the middle of it, there's a loop carry dependency. So you think, yeah, there's no way the auto vectorizer is going to, to you know, just chomp through this and, and vectorize it. It does. It breaks the big loop into three separate loops. The middle one is the one that has the loop carry dependency and therefore goes slowly. It, it runs at scalar speed. But the, the two other, other loops run vectorized. So, so I'd caution against ever turning off auto vectorization, even if you believe that we could not get there. Because, you know, maybe we won't in a current release, but sometime in the future, we'll crack. Man, that was cool. I thank you for interviewing him. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say, it's always wonderful when all you have to do is write code as you sure. normally write it, and then the compiler does some rocket science magic. Yeah, the free lunch, you know? So. Beautiful, man. I, I love that stuff. I want to talk to more compiler people, man. I think people agree. So let's keep doing it. Absolutely. We right on. So that. one of the things while we wrap up here, I mm -hmm. wanted to just uh, kind of throw out some... Uh, love to the Lang.next people. Okay. They're putting on a great event, April 2nd to the 4th. So it's just coming. It's just yeah. coming up. This is a programming languages conference. It's designed for programming language designers and implementers. Okay. Um, the cast of speakers is phenomenal. We have Gilad Braca from Dart. We have the inventor of Scala. I see. Java, C Sharp, F Sharp, C++, oh, D, great. Go, R, Julia. There's a lot of languages represented here, and it's going to be amazing. Lots of great conversations. So if you can't make it, sure. uh, all the sessions will be on Channel 9. Not okay. live, but we're going to record them. On and demand. a bunch of interviews on demand. So a great technical refresh, particularly for those like me, you know, yeah. we cannot uh, check the state of the art of all the languages yes. that are available. You just read some uh, articles or blogs and you have the feeling you have an idea. Here we will have like an in-depth yes. you know, dive on. Hey man, if you're into programming languages and this is what, you know, remember when we talked about the C++ renaissance? Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, really, and Eric Meyer brought this point up in an interview I've done with him recently. There's really a programming languages renaissance going on. Mm -hmm. And it's across yes. the whole spectrum. Now, yes. in the native world, there's mm -hmm. definitely a native renaissance. Sure. Go is a great programming language Absolutely. for the certain set of you know, uses in its certain domain. Yes. D, I find D to be extraordinarily interesting. It's like C sharp plus C plus plus, mm -hmm. plus true. first class pure functions. Sure. Awesome. C plus plus 11. Beautiful. Right? I see. So, there's a renaissance going on in the native world, in the managed world, mm -hmm. in the functional world, the sure. imperative world, the static world, dynamic world. It's a beautiful thing. Great. So gum. Also, C++ and beyond. Got a shout out to those guys. That's in August. OK. Um, Let's explain for those who are not familiar. C++ and beyond is the conference of C++ who? and beyond is a conference for, for C++ engineers. OK. Um, 
and it's the Eric, it's the uh, Andre Alexandrescu, Scott Myers, and Herb Sutter show. So the three amigos. The three amigos, man. C++. Oh, yeah. So right. it's going to be all about C++11, as you can imagine. Highly recommended. It's going to be in North Carolina. They always find these beautiful places yes. to have it. I'm going to be there with my camera, so watch out if you go again. I'm going to want to get yes. you on camera. And correct me if I'm wrong. It's, you know, it's on C++11, but these guys particularly focus on the best ways of taking the most of the language. You know? Maybe like pushing the boundaries. I mean, not a going wrong, you know, but yeah. it's like doing with the language things that you don't do it traditionally, you know, like Absolutely. Best, uh, best practices, best patterns. You got it. So remember, these three guys are authors yes. of probably the most famous, beyond Bjarna's book, sure. uh, C++ books in the world. Absolutely. Effective C++, right? Yes. Effective STL, more effective STL. Yes. All this stuff, the great stuff that Scott Myers does. So sure. it's a place where you go as a practitioner sure. to learn about things that maybe you hadn't thought about before and get a deeper perspective into what you can actually use today. So it's a practitioner's event. Yes. In fact, Herb Sutter in his keynote in Going Native, mm -hmm. he mentioned like a sort of roadmap about these books being rewritten. He said that during this year, even the next year, you know, Scott Myers himself mm -hmm. and even Bjorn were re rewriting, you know, the top books on C++. So yeah. I guess that in C++ and beyond, we are going to get a glimpse of what they are. You better believe it. You know, envisioning and researching. Excellent point. I hope right. so. I hope I so. Mean, that I hope so. Are you going? Yes, I man. Feel some MP, I'm you know? going to be there. You guys, you should come too. I well, come mean, on. We'll do going native on site. They tell my boss, you know, to. I'll send tell me. your boss. Hey, okay. Raul, come on, dude. So uh, I wanted to throw out two more things. Mm -hmm. Another, this destructor is lasting longer than normal. Forgive yes. us. Now, um, XAML plus C plus 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 DX. Yes. That to me is a really incredibly interesting scenario. Okay. Because when I think about building these metro apps with C++ and XAML or HTML5, sure. um, the missing ingredient, in my opinion, is this super performant visualization capability. Absolutely. And the fact that you can have a DX surface on a XAML control mm -hmm. in a C++ app sure. on Windows, yes, yes, that's yes. beautiful stuff. Absolutely. I think C++ developers are the ones that are going to push the boundary of metro sure. apps. So start writing them, man. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you need. By the way, thank you to Diego and the C++ team for the excellent WRL documentation now available on MSTN. We finally did. Yeah. yeah. If you have any questions about what you should use or why you should use it, there it is. Mm -hmm. Code samples, beautiful explanation. Highly recommend it. Sure. So rock and roll, man. There is more documentation coming up. Of course, you know, it's like we had to segment and prioritize. Yes, uh, WRL couldn't make it in the first, in the developer preview stage. It's mm -hmm. making in the beta. There are still more documentation coming for RTM, you know. Awesome. Hey, so. man, I've been playing around with that, uh, with reading the documentation and playing with the code. Great. I mean, rock and roll. Yes, we are already writing certain articles now that we have more time, you know, to think about how to use cool. thing and share with the audience. So you Right on. Something. So hey, everybody out there, let us know what you want to see. We did hear you. We yes, still please. know you want to know how mm -hmm. other people use C++ in the company. We're going to get there. Absolutely. Um, but for now, stay native, brothers and sisters. Ready? Okay. Boom!